Welcome to the last talk of the stage today. So today we're gonna talk about rethinking codes of conduct. Um, a little bit of disclaimer about this talk. It's, uh, this is not a coding talk, so it's not about, there's no so much scientific information that I can vouch for. Mostly it's about opinions and my opinions and other people's opinions, so don't, uh, like, if you disagree, that's totally fine. Um, okay, so let's, uh, yeah, so this is a, an old painting that I found. Okay, so, oops, no, I did, okay. So yeah, about me, so my pronouns are, are uh, she, her, you can uh, reach me at uh, hello at teresayovci.com. Um, this is the picture of a meetup we had with uh, the diversity and inclusion work group with the Python Software Foundation that I'm part of. I am head of data science at Noe Fisher. We do data science boot camps and I'm also offering leadership coaching. So if you need an inclusive leadership coaching, I'm organizer of the PyLadies Hamburg. I am on the board of the Python Software Verband, which is running this conference, um, and I'm also part of the Code of Conduct work group and the Diversity and Inclusion work groups of the Python Software Foundation. And because I have a lot of free time, I am also part of the DISC committee, so which is a diversity and inclusion in scientific computing with NIME focus group. And I also do artsy stuff and knit under the TAPIAP label, which don't ask what it means. So. Uh, a lot of hats, let's say I don't get bored, and I wasn't planning on giving this talk here today, <laughs> but some speakers uh, decided they couldn't make it anymore, so here I am. So, first question, who here is contributing to open source by this definition? You're contributing, you're writing bug reports, you're maintainers, okay, cool, okay. What about the invisible work? Who here is contributing to open source according to this additional definition? Working in education, educating other people, supporting people, governance, spreading the work, organizing conferences, volunteering at conferences. Already we see that all the people with the green t-shirt, they obviously contribute to open source because you have a volunteer or organizer swag. So yeah. Some people say that the uh, glue of all this open source working out and surviving is the community behind it. Um, so why do we like Python? This is a 2017 quote from Brett Cannon. I came here for the language, but I stayed for the community. And uh, this was a picture taken at PyCon 2017 and people already posted that on t-shirts. So if you, yeah. A, lo a little bit of a short history of Python, according to me, of course, from a German perspective. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening in Python, so I'm not going to go there. But in case you didn't know, in 1991, Guido von Rossum released first Python version. I don't know, it was Python 1 or something. Anyway, then I think in 2001, the Python Software Foundation was formed. So it's quite late. Then in 2003, we had the first PyCon US, which is happening, started now, so it's, they are they having a 20 years anniversary. In 2004, the Python Software Verband, the one that is financing and running this conference, um, was formed and it had a funny name that nobody remembers. I mean, some people remember, but I don't remember, so <laughs> I think somebody nods in the back that, uh, so he knows. I also just found out the name uh, this week because they had to rename it because it was a funny name. In 2011, we had the first uh, PyCon DE in uh, Leipzig, I think. So um, quite a long time ago. Anybody here was there? Wow, okay, that's cool. So yeah, then what happened? In 2012, NumFocus gets created. So PyCon DE is older than NumFocus. And in 2013, the PSF announces its first code of conduct. So quite a lot of stuff happened before <laughs> code of conduct came on, uh, you know, in play. Uh, in 2018, around 2018, um, Sage Sharp Otter Technologies updated the Python Software Foundation code of conduct. Um, 
why I'm mentioning this is because at the moment the Python Software Foundation Code of Conduct is one of the better written codes of conduct out there. And I will talk today a little bit about why that matters. So why do we need a code of conduct? So why did Python Software Foundation need a code of conduct? So this is a link, you can scan it, it's a blog um, on the PSF site. Basically it was voted as they felt, so 10 years ago, so the PSF code of conduct is gonna be 10 years old today, this year. It was vo voted because they felt they were unbalanced and not seeing the true spectrum of the greater community and thought that with, the ti with time they could advance towards a more diverse representation. So this is what we wanted 10 years ago. And let's do a small exercise now. Because some of us were like, I don't, why do we, should we care about codes of conduct, right? Like, I mean, everything is fine, nothing happened today, everything was well, usually nothing bad happens. But let's think of situations. So who here can think of a situation you had a conflict or tension with another person? You know, like, it can be at work, can be in the Python community, in another Python community, there's a lot of Python, in general, yeah? Think of a situation where someone wrote or spoke using language that made you feel uncomfort, unwelcome. Yeah? Think about a situation where you felt you were stereotyped based on your perceived demographics. Yeah. Okay, this is a hard one. You were stalked or harassed. Yeah, so question number one to think about it, did you tell someone? Yeah, some people said, did you report it? Some people reported, yeah. Was it easy to talk about it? No, okay. Let's do the other side of the coin. Think of a situation where someone had a conflict or tension with you. Yeah, it happens to the best of us. I mean, we can be on both sides of the coin. You wrote or spoke using un a language that made someone feel unwelcome. Yeah. You stereotype based on perceived demographics. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna ask about stalking. Please don't. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, let's, uh, yeah. So, but the questions here come on the other side. Were you able to receive feedback elegantly? <laughs> hmm? Yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? It's like someone comes and tells you, hey, you are an asshole, and you're like, what? I'm never an asshole, yeah. Did you find it easy to understand what you did wrong? Because in our, you know, inner mirror, you know, our mirror shows us as perfect people, and then comes someone that says you're not perfect, and it shatters our universe, okay? So, we may at any given point in time be on any side of the coin. It's just because we are all different and it's really hard to, you know, you don't grow up in other people's shoes and they don't grow up in your shoes. And it's like takes a lot lifetime of learning how to, you know, identify other people's shoes. And why does it matter? Because who is contributing to open source? So this is a map, like the geography of open source for, uh, from, I think it's a, um, GitHub uh, survey, and even though it looks like there's a lot of people in the United States contributing to open source at per capita level, also Germany is not doing that bad. Um, so our Python community is global. Very few of us had a global upbringing and education. I don't know how many of us moved to, to five countries by the time we were 16. Because that would mean like a global upbringing to like really go somewhere else, have different people change. So, so we grew up in like little bubbles, right? Most all of us. Humans learn their whole life about other humans and cultures and we need to accept that we don't know everything about everybody. Like a lot of us is hidden and we don't just go to a new stranger and just tell us our life story to them in like instantly, right? So. And we need to just keep learning and get better. So in my opinion, a code of conduct can be a framework to help us truly communicate globally in a successful way. This, but it's not like something that, you know, you get it right the first time. It's like, oh, I read the code of conduct, I can now apply it. It takes practice, it takes, you know, wanting to learn. 
the PSF code of conduct has this um, quote, I was saying that uh, it's one of the better written, so the Python community is made of members from around the globe with diverse, of, uh, diverse set of skills, personalities, and experience. And when we are working together, this code of conduct will help us steer your interactions and keep Python a positive, successful, and growing community. And we want basically code of conduct to, to encode core values and norms in the community. For example, inclusivity, respectfulness, and being open and considerate, and provide, us, um, provide guidance to newcomers. And it can also signal to marginalized people that the open source community cares. That also means that when there is no code of conduct, the other signal gets sent, right? So, and yeah. So let's talk a little bit about is our code of conduct working or not? How can you tell that your code of conduct is not working? Well, according to the Linux uh, Foundation survey, the diversity and inclusion survey from 2021, these were the reporting statistics. So apparently, like, I don't know, over 50%, so yeah, this is not a good, not a very good graph, but anyways. So a lot of people reported lack of response um, or rejection of contributions and questions. So in the code of conduct with the PSF, we get a lot of reports about somebody dismissed my issue and just closed the issue and didn't listen to me. And so this is happening, right? Conflict or interpersonal tension between you and another contributor, written or spoken language that made people feel unwelcome, stereotyping, threats of violence, talking, Unsolicited, unsolicited sexual advances or comments, impersonation or malicious publication of personal, personal information. So whenever we have statistics that say, within this amount of time, we didn't receive any reports, so everything is going on fine. That is not what the data says that's the distribution, <laughs> what's going on out there, right? So, so this is an actually should be a flag. If you don't have reports, doesn't, it doesn't mean that everything is going fine. It actually means that people don't feel safe to report, people don't feel that it's worth reporting, people are not able to report, people are not able to have a positive conversation. So why, why don't people report? So these are some things that I've noticed. I've noticed poorly written code of conduct. Um, when the code of conduct is written badly, <laughs> you end up spending like over an hour just reading through all the links and the documentation of the website to find out if your issue, what happened to you, is a code of conduct situation. And then you're like so unsure, and then in the end you're even doubting yourself, and then you're like, I don't, is this, this is, and then by the time you're done reading, you think you're imagining everything that happened to you. So. So it's like hard to identify your situation itself, and the statements on the code of conduct are going to be vague, which when they are dealing with your issue, it, a lot of things will be up for interpretation. I don't know, did anybody here in the room feel like this happened to them? They reported something somewhere, and in the end, it was like, yeah, I don't know, it didn't violate anything, or it's like, you're imagining it or something like that. So, so this can be really frustrating and it will take a lot of effort on the person who reports to report. And that's usually people give up reporting. Another thing that I've noticed is that many times code of conduct in events, especially in events because these are like appearing, they're happening, you know, and then they don't happen anymore, right? The code of conduct can be treated as a technicality. So we have to have a code of conduct. Oh, yeah, we have to add it to the website. Otherwise, otherwise some people will complain, and then they do it for these reasons. <laughs> you know? Some people say, like, I'm not going to attend an event if it doesn't have a code of conduct. And then they write the organizers, there's no code of conduct, I'm not coming. And then they like, say, oh, we have to put a code of conduct, somebody complain. So there's ways to like not have that, you know, like I think with PyLadies meetups, we usually at every event at the beginning of the meetup, we talk about code of conduct. It happened also at this conference, at the opening session, there was talk about the code of conduct was explained. Everybody was on there now theoretically is on the same page about our expectations of behavior at this conference. 
Okay, so another thing, code of conduct is perceived as annoying, like this annoying must have, something that gets forgotten at the, at the end, an afterthought, and no enforcing committee is set. So we have a code of conduct, but we don't do anything with it. It turns out that 30% of the people who filled in the, the survey from the Linux Foundation, diversity and inclusion survey, are unsure codes of conduct will be enforced. That is a big number. That means like, there's just no process. Even to the people that have ever applied, they don't even get an email at the end. It's like, oh, we got your report. Thank you. We are dealing with this. Or this dialogue that puts people at ease didn't happen. Another thing where I've noticed is conflicts of interest. You may actually have people in the Code of Conduct Committee that are the ones whom the report is about. You know, like when you have like older com communities where the founders of the communities are wearing too many hats, they are in the, also in the code, you know, like, and you know, there's just lack of change and you know, the world is changing, but some people don't change and then they're everywhere and you can't complain anymore because they would get the report and how can you even report if you know that the person who re you're reporting about is in the committee or friends of the people, right? So, and this is something that people who are like in a code of conduct committee and end up recusing themselves at every meeting because, oh, I can't have an opinion about this person. I can't say my opinion about this person because we're friends and I know and we contributed to code together and I can't say anything. And if you recuse yourself most of the time, then why are you in that committee? You want to be in a committee, go to another community and do the code of conduct committee. And another thing that's happening, and this is why I'm having this talk also to rethink about code of conduct, is like people in the community, some people, not of course, not everybody, there are some people that think that the role of the code of conduct is to be the police. And, and I mean, <laughs> this call it a generation divide, call it, it can be all sorts of reasons why this is happening, but this has happened even in the Python Software Foundation where the Code of Conduct Committee doesn't have any power. We only recommend actions to the steering council. We don't actually kick people off the mailing list. We don't ban people from contributing to Python. But this is not really understood by the general uh, Python developer community and we did get, I've seen application to the steering council where the text of the application was, I will remove some of the power that the code of conduct committee has because we have now lost some very experts <laughs> who are contributing and then they got kicked out because of uh, their behavior, you know, like, and again, so, if you have a good process, you know, like, we don't have the power to do that. We just, you know, like, um, recommend. We wouldn't really lose this power. This is like, um, this power doesn't exist anyway to be lost in the first place. So, how can we get our codes of conduct working? So here I have, like, um, the part about writing the code of conduct, the text itself, and enforcing the code of conduct. So these are two things I think that are the two. So the writing code of conduct from what I've seen is first you have the values, right? The values of the community are explicitly mentioned and they represent the members in the community. Now think about of all the companies, I don't know how many of you work in a company, do you have values defined in your company? Top down, bottom up, I don't know. You know. There's always mission, vision, you know, sometimes it's room for improvement in some companies, but in also in some communities. So these values, if they're like not transparent that they exist, then how can people like even, you know, use those? So this is basically, these are the values of the Python Software Foundation Code of Conduct, uh, being open, considerate, respectful, and then they're also explained. Then in the end, this whole code of conduct definition, you can like come back to it and then see if any of these values you feel like got like um, crossed. The second part about writing the code of conduct is defining the norms and standards. 
like what are the behaviors that are acceptable and what are the behaviors that are not acceptable? How do you deal with those? You know, what's the process? So here, there are plenty of good examples out there. Nobody today is writing from scratch their code of conduct. I mean, that would be like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of collaborative work that all of the codes of conduct are, out there are at the moment like, um, license that everybody can use, so they are on free licenses because this is something that everybody wants everybody to get better at. So there's zero reason for this not to be used. Yeah. So the again from the Python Software Foundation again there's a whole list of what's inappropriate, and it's really easy to say like if this, you know. If you, like, stalking is there, you know, I don't have to think about it, like, I got followed, I don't want to be followed, I, um, logging, it's like, doxing is public, you know, having uh, language, violent language directed against another person. So all of these things are, there's, the list is longer. Uh, this is just a screenshot. So all of these things are described explicitly, and it's also then easy for you to say, okay, this was not inclusive. Um, okay, so now let's remember the situations where, you remember at the beginning of the talk, we were talking about the situations. So the, ideally, this code of conduct, how it is defined, should be helping you with talking about the situations, you as a person reporting. It, sh it should help you better understand what behavior, you know, putting it in words to explain what was not acceptable about what happened to you, but also if you are on the other side, you know, to understand that. Um, you can also think about what are the values. A lot of times you need to talk about your feelings and then you're like, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what was that feeling, what happened to me. And, and then it's also something that validates because a lot of the times when something happens to us, we are unsure. Like how many times did something happen to you and then you went for a second opinion to ask whether this was really like, do you really think this, like, am I in the right? Should I feel offended about this or am I like, you know, sensitive and... Yeah, so this should be with a, pro a proper code of conduct. You shouldn't need to ask another person for... Um, saying that, yes, you're right, you know, because our society is teaching us that, no, we are not right, so the code of conduct is there to help. Okay, and then comes the second part, enforcement. So you have to think about codes of conduct are a grassroots movement. They were, they were not like top-down, like the sea level, something decided they want a code of conduct. It was mostly the people, the community self-regulated and said, we need to define our guidelines and, and we need to say, if you are like also organizing a conference, organizing an event, organizing a community, you need to prioritize having a committee at your event. So, okay, you have a code of conduct, you found the perfect code of conduct, but if that doesn't get enforced, then it doesn't matter, right? Because then people complain and nothing happens. It's like when somebody says, you can give me feedback, and they give you feedback and then say, and then you're like, but I'm not going to use the feedback, right? So then you don't give feedback. So for this, then you also need to have a clear process for enforcement that gets defined. And it usually happens that, again, the same like diversity, code of conduct is like an afterthought in many situation, situations. You know, people think about, yeah, we have it, but then it's not really prioritized. And again, all of the stuff what I said before, you need training. It's learnable stuff. You, and people who are in committees, you should expect, a, like if I see a committee, I know that a lot of people have expectations that at least some of the people in the committee have proper training for code of conduct. And if you're asking yourself, how do I get in code of conduct committees? Well, this is really easy. You volunteer because this is like the part that, as, as it's an afterthought, usually in many places, people like really close to the event day are scrambling for volunteers. Oh, we don't have a volunteer for the code of conduct. So this is perfect opportunity. 
the place where you will always find the spot. Last month, we did a code of conduct enforcement training with Otter technology with Sage. So they are actually the ones that are like, I think at the moment, the, the most know-how about code of conduct enforcement. And in this training, we learned, like we discussed how to take an incident report, how to listen, how to respond to a reported person, how to evaluate the report, how to collect the data and preserve privacy at the same time, because you know you want to make a safe space. The code of conduct process should be safe. So I can totally recommend this enforcement training and any other training that Sage has. And yeah, this is my sketch note from the event, but you won't be able to read it here. So, and so closing, I have some community statements. So one of them is from Drew. Drew is in the code of conduct work group with the PSF. And he says, I want to help make it easier for organizations to see why having a strong code of conduct enhances community rather than stifles it. And Noah, Noah Tamir, who you've seen keynoting yesterday, they say, I would like to see the code of conduct being used not just for major incidents, but also as a mediation tool for small incidents. And small incidents, for a lot of us, for, for some people, they are not an incident. For some people, they're like borderline incident. Those are like really hard to deal with because you're like, hmm, yeah, I mean, you know, but this person is doing 100 borderline incidents per month, right? So maybe it's not so borderline. And or, but also small incidents like microaggressions, which are also super ambiguous to deal with and helping us in general like talk about things and not just when the house is burning. And think about it, the future developers, so this is from GitHub, Python developers, a lot of them everywhere. Our Python community is global. We need to understand that we truly need to invest in learning how to communicate with each other. You know, we are not born communicators. Like, actually, we don't know how to speak when we're babies, I heard. Here, anybody has babies? They don't know how to talk yet, right? So they learn speaking one language, you know, another language. I mean, ChatGPT is going to solve all our problems, but let's see. And <laughs> so, yeah. So let's do this together. Improve our communication culture in our communities. And that was it. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, you can reach out to me. This is. Um, a quote from Jessica, she's also in the uh, Python Software Foundation Code of Conduct work group and did the workshop and after that posted this about it. So if you have any questions and or disagreements or opinions. <laughs> yeah. I do appreciate a lot your thoughts. I have a whole uh, article written just for uh, taking notes. Uh, I don't have questions in Slidos, but I do have a... Um, does anyone here would like to ask a question? Yeah, I'm <laughs> okay. um, Yeah, thank you for, uh, for your interesting talk. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big topic, obviously. Um, uh, would you maybe share, I mean, anonymously, of course, uh, some examples where you saw that the reporting certain type of uh, yeah incidents really helped to to improve the situation or like y you've seen for example the same person who was reported that it was just different uh, like uh, what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say um, maybe th do you see the the impact of being or having a code of conduct in place like w and in which areas yes I think so I, I think one of the one of the most visible things that we also dealt with, I think, with in, within the PSF and had a lot of discussions about was the, re, the renaming of the master branch to main, also in Python, and there were very a lot of very upset people. And but this also gave a platform for people to say. to be able to be told that they're not right to be upset about. Like, this is not something in 2020 that you should be on that front. And I think 
there were also some public statements made about this on Python. Other things, I think, we sometimes get uh, people reaching out who did not have a report against them, but someone said you, so someone, they wrote something and then someone said, but you, you this is kind of like non-inclusive, how you talk to me according to the code of conduct. So somebody, so sometimes people like, without reporting it, but they use the code of conduct in like a comment on GitHub. And um, then this person actually reached out to us for us to explain how, what did they do wrong, you know? So some people are open for this dialogue. So it gets, you know, like, it, it brings a little bit of visibility that this, there is a place for this dialogue and it's moving some people forward. And in the end it was like, hey, you said this code is useless, you know? So useless is a, when you read it, it has a tone in your head, right? So, um, and it's a lot of work for whoever reads the sentence that something is useless to not see it as um, that tone, right? So, so there's that. Of course, um, sometimes in events, I think in events it's a little bit written so a different. So in, with the Python Software Foundation, we have like uh, written reports, but with events you need to act completely differently. So if something happens, you need to sometimes remove a person from a conference. And that can make a big difference for a lot of other people. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that or been in a situation where you had to be the someone had to be removed from an event. I mean, pie ladies, it's always sometimes something happens in the meetups that are about with diverse groups, so I think there we definitely need a code of conduct to have some dialogue. Yeah. Um, we are, let me check the time. Ta -da. We are kind of over time, but I do have a question about talking about the language. Um, I have two kind of different questions. One is about, don't you think, inf I have issues with the word enforcement. enforcement <laughs> I have yeah. serious issues with that especially because we are volunteer base, mm -hmm. and even doing the training, we're still in the volunteer base. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think this, the word enforcement here is not about that you're enforcing something on somebody. It's more about the process itself that you, in order to make sure that the, um, the process is fair for everybody, you need to follow some steps. Like, this is more like, it's about how you, yes, it, and it's a lot more work, right? Because instead of just having a conversation on the hallway, somebody says something happened, now you actually have to write it down somewhere in a way that it doesn't fall back to that person getting discriminated or something bad happens to that. So there's a lot of reasons why it's, imp or even when you talk to the person that got reported, you need to, you know, have a specific language to give feedback, otherwise it can all <laughs> explode. So, so this word enforcement, yes, it sounds very harsh, but it's just, it's, n it's not about like on enforcing it on people, but it's more about the fact that you kind of have to follow a process and not following a process in this case can have a little bit of uh, bad repercussions to different people. Thank you. We are really, anyone would like to do some comment or share something? So I appreciate a lot of your thoughts and sharing your experience and thank you all for participating. Thank you.